Hey guys, and welcome back to Trek Yards. I'm Captain Foley. And as always, I am Colonel Cockins. Discovery episode 5? That's more than 4. Less than 6. Number 5. And it is called Choose Your Pain. And as they tend to go, very literal within the episode, they tend to either call it out or something, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll straight, jump straight in, Stuart. What's your general overall thoughts of this episode? I was really impressed. I really enjoyed this episode. Um, pretty much everything about it. Um, I thought it was a fantastic episode and fun to watch. And a few surprises too, so I'm looking forward to sharing those with you guys. Okay, and it seems like we have another opposite opinion this week. Orville was opposites, and this appears to be the same. Uh, I was I was disappointed, a bit blare the whole time, and a little bit bored at times. Really? Um, with some really annoying bits that I was just like, guys, you're letting yourself down quite badly. Um, so I'm excited to hear why you think it's so good. Okay. I'm excited to hear why you think it sucked. Well, it didn't suck, just it was a very meh episode. Um, they really could have done better. But let's go scene gotcha. by scene. So we start off with a dream sequence. Mm -hmm. Which I called it, I called it a dream sequence before anybody, like, you know, I'm like, it's probably a dream. And all yep. of a sudden she wakes up. Like, yeah. Yep. At first, I th at first I thought it was like an alien infiltrating the ship and like roaming That'd around. Yeah. But with no one on the bridge, I was like, eh, it's not probably probably not what it is. But yeah. yeah, I do like the imagery though. She's turning on a version of herself. I thought it might have been the tardigrade talking to her. That would have been cool. Mm. More direct. I mean, she's got this psychic link with Sarek, so we know she's heavily psychically, you know, all that rubbish. So that would have been cool. I thought at the end it would turn into tardigrade and be like, Arr! but it was powerful that it was her torturing her. It's interesting mm -hmm. to see how, you know, obviously every normal Trek show, it follows the captain and the primary crew on missions. Now we're seeing it follow a Lower Decks character. It's interesting to see how they're realising that concept. You mm -hmm. know, keeping her important, yet not essential, yet sort of essential. But, you know, it's interesting the balance there that they're yeah. reaching. Yeah. Yeah. So we know it's a, as you said, it's a dream sequence. And we know now, too, that Tilly snores. I thought that was worth noting. Which is chronic snoring, doesn't she? Might, it might be, yeah, it might be important later. Yes. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Had to point it out. Anyway, so the tardigrade isn't feeling the best. And uh, Dr. Culver, uh, I got to admit, I love his white uniform, although it looks like a dress uniform. But I know it's just a, m a medical uniform, so I like it. It's funny how he wasn't shown this character, and then boom, this episode he was like, I'm in every other scene. You know, mm -hmm. this, is, mm -hmm. this is his, the first was his pilot, this is his main episode. Um, and he's a very subdued character, very mm -hmm. thoughtful, very... Like, he, he is the, probably the only person on the entire ship doing things for the right reasons. <laughs> Without any agenda. Oh, well, yeah, I guess so far that we've learned about, yeah, I guess. Yeah. He's just a good guy doing good things. <laughs> he's a doctor, mm -hmm. he's there, although he's not chief of chief of medical, because they do say later on the... Uh, the, CM, the, CM, the CMO needs, a, needs help yeah. in a Dorian tonsillectomy, yes. Yes. So, yeah. I, that would have been interesting to see that as well. But anyway. <laughs> Cut two, Todd Sliders. Why are we mm -hmm. here? Ah, it's interesting. Yes. Um, <laughs> the next oh. scene is a Starbase. Uh, very interesting design. Um, yes. It looks like it belongs on a planet's surface. Maybe it can land and become like a, a skyscraper. Because it, it looks like... Hmm. I don't know. It looks like something I've seen before. Oh, it's out of Mass Effect. I mean, I've seen this design before sort of thing. It's a, it's a very odd design. Um, and, and once again, the space CG is incredibly dark. Mm -hmm. You can barely see any of the ships around it. You know, this is this is the the cool first star base, and yet you get an ultra vague sense of what it is. Um, kind of odd odd choice with that. Um, you do I'm, see some ships though, if you zoom in. Yeah, no, I, I know, but like you don't you don't get to enjoy them. Like you can tell which yeah. that one is and what that one is, but it's just like oh, they're just ships. You know, they're not letting us savor the space stuff really. Um, not, not really sure why. That's a good point. Actually, you're right. There's no like nice flybys or anything. I mean, Discovery gets some nice beauties, but she's not doing anything normally. Because you think about it to Voyager, like they really loved showing us the ship, and she always looked good in, in bright light and you know, flybys. It's, it's weird how this show is really. I mean, it is the dark of space. I mean, it does as someone who does a lot of 3D animating, basically every single day. You know, how dark it is 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 nice because you realize how dark space is. You get that feel. But mm -hmm. the same token, there's a lot of ambient light, bounce back light. Like there's a planet right there, so it actually should be very bright. You know, yeah. not very yeah. bright, but little thing, but it's just noteworthy. Um, yeah. And then we get this briefing. We get our first look at a you know, Starfleet <coughs> section. Well. And what do you think of this scene, this uh, tactical briefing scene? 
I, I liked it actually. Uh, I do like the hologram on the table, mm-hmm. but <laughs> um, I love the maps in the background. They refer to Corvin too. These are the things that the Discovery has taken care of so far. Mm. Corvin two. Uh, they stopped the supply line at the in the Benzar system. Benzite, which Benzar. we know are the blue guys that need the breathing masks. Yes, Yay, Benzites. And in the Vega system, uh, was it Vega? There's <laughs> something. Uh, uh, yeah, I wrote Vega for some reason, but maybe I misheard it. Anyway, yeah, they did something there, and they're important. Now, so it's been three weeks, and Discovery is already doing full-on tactical missions. What did you think of the science ship with limited tactical power now being the actually, you know, being utilized instantly to be the tip of the spear as as Lorca wanted? I never really considered that, but you're right; it is a science vessel. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not super impressed with that, if that's the case, because, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a vehicle made for war, so why send it in behind enemy lines all the time? For military, like proper military, we, we said it last time, stealth and survey missions, best thing you can do. You know, the, the Admiral is very specific that they want to duplicate the technology. Mm-hmm. We've got a classified facility in Jefferson, Iowa, building units. Not building ships, thank goodness, mm-hmm. but building but they- units. Yeah, they did say they want to get the spore drive on as many Starfleet ships as possible. Yes. Yes. But the, the Iowa JJ reference, which is great, and they're not building ships, <laughs> they're building pieces, which is great. Yes. But that's interesting, so they want to build as many ships as possible. Now, do they need the rotating saucer? Because if they need the rotating saucer, and we learn some stuff later on that really changes the idea of the Discovery ship, they have to, they have to design warships around the concept of a spinning saucer. That's mm. a, such a limit to what you can do, or do you just build a discovery again with more weapons? You, you know what I mean? It, it, mm-hmm. as, and, and wouldn't you rip off, like, wouldn't you take out the discovery's spore drive if it's if, it, if it's the internal drive itself, put onto a warship now, or if you need the spinning bit, then, you know, what a, how can you build warship? I mean, obviously they could, well, but it's such a, you know, it's a tactical <coughs> ship, it's such a weak spot. Yeah, well, it is Starfleet. I don't think they have warships or battleships necessarily. The war just started seven months yeah. earlier, yeah. so they're used to exploration, so... Yeah, I don't know exactly what they're doing that way. I'm, I'm assuming uh, probably they're just going to build discovery variants, take the basic frame, add in more power, take yeah. all the science labs, add in weapon, you know, re- refit the, the premise. Because <clears throat> to redesign an entire ship around a concept is kind of takes more than seven months to design that ship. You know, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. they have to use another discovery design. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even with five or six discoveries, I, I feel like a concerted Klingon fleet would still be able to take you out. You know, there are limitations yeah. to this technology unless you could put it on a Connie. You know, you throw a Connie in, in enemy lines, you could do a lot of carnage. You yeah. Know, take on all small ships apart from the D7s. Uh, so basically, yeah, we heard that they wanted to discover to dial back its infiltration of Klingon space. Uh, they're ordered to kind of rein in the spore, use of the spore drive a little bit because the Klingons are starting to kind of... Well, they're afraid that the Klingons are starting to get suspicious as to what's going on, which they rightfully should. Yeah, how did our convoy 50 light years into, into our space get destroyed? But nothing around it but us. It's like, that's... Mm. Hmm, and they they Federation weird weapon signatures. I think they've got teleportation, but, you know, it did... Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Although, shouldn't, shouldn't the Klingons... If there's been a month since the last episode, shouldn't the Klingons now be using the cloaking sarcophagus ship? Shouldn't they be now doing raids and stuff? Probably not. They probably took that back to Kronos and are either researching it to, to put that um, yeah. the cloaking device on other ships, yeah. gearing up for more war, or who knows what Kors or what his name is is yeah, doing with cool. the ship right now. Because I, I, honestly, I think actually the cloaking device is a is a superior tactical advantage in this war because you could cloak any ship to for, uh, you know Earth, and if you had a cloaked Klingon fleet at Earth. Doesn't matter if the Discovery can jump in; it can't take out those ships. You know, it can't jump to Kronos and win the battle. Mm-hmm. So there is, a, you know, obviously you could go back and destroy the Klingons' capital building, but they could send an entire cloak fleet and destroy all of your. You know, so I think in terms of the two secret weapons of this war, the Klingons actually do have the advantage there if they can utilize it and and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, the next scene is just in the galley. Another scene with Tilly where she's wanting to talk to Michael. She's and trying she's to be afraid- a friend. Yeah, she's afraid that Michael's got cooler friends now because she's been on the ship for a while. I love that scene. I did, everything yeah. about Tilly, I'm just loving. She's just so cute. Um, she, she's she's the base of the comic relief of the show, but without being funny, you know. Yeah, yeah. She's the heart yeah. of this show in a sense. I think she's I think she's a relatable one. I think everybody knows somebody like her. 
so you feel like you, you really know her. So yeah, yeah. And it's nice to have someone nice. Yes. Uh, and did you note that they're no longer using colourful plates or anything, and the chairs are sitting in the primary ones, these ones are now very sort of modern. Uh, so they're pulled back away from the, that third episode of TOS colour schemes. It's far um, more generic -y, white, clean, as I yeah. felt. That, that side shot, both of them, there's, there's literally... It's just... I mean, there's, you know. Yeah, there is a smattering of the old chairs. If you look behind there Terry is. there, you yeah. can see... Uh, so I don't know if they're slowly fading them out or if they're going to have a mix of both throughout. It, um, it's kind of sad they pulled out, they took away that reference. I guess the director didn't want to, didn't want that reference anymore. Yeah, well, we'll we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the next scene, we got uh, Captain Lorca taking the shots or whatever mm. to the eyes because he doesn't want to lose his real eyes, but he's got that aversion to light still. Um, so it's interesting. And uh, then the Admiral comes in the room and sees him at the table yet turns the lights on oh I didn't see you there you're just that bad I'm sorry <laughs> yeah that was she did not see him yeah exactly you know and he did not turn when the, yeah but hey she she's obviously jealous of his, uh, jealous of his power and his command and stuff I and mean, that, that's like the whole point of the scene almost mm. they have this whole long also I do like this set it's, it's a nice set it's a very Stargate set a very Stargate Atlantis Mm. Just, just the way it's formatted, those sorts of hexagonal things. Yeah, uh, and they're, they're, but I do like the different war monitors. Yes, it looks cool. Like that's good design. You can look around, you can see anybody, especially if you know you're looking. So if you're, let's say, an admiral, and your your space is sector G. Well, if you have the opposite screen to you is sector G showing the layout, then you can relay information, and you've got your notes right in front of you. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that'd be quite, uh, quite clever. But yeah, yeah. they're talking about uh, Michael Burnham and how. She thinks he's wrong with this. The only mutineer ever in Starfleet. Didn't, Which didn't, is didn't, funny. Didn't... Yeah, please. Because yeah. I think it's... Uh, what episode now? Uh, maybe Tholian Web? Oh, yes, it was Tholian Web. Where Spock says there's never been one recorded instance of a mutiny on a Starfleet vessel. Mm -hmm. Ever. Mm -hmm. um, except it... for my sister, my Which foster sister. I don't sister. want you to know about. I so won't... we're not going to tell you. I can see it in the file. And you don't read the files yourself because you're illiterate, Captain. So, n never, never happened. But yeah, it's creative retelling. You know, I, I want to avoid talking about my sister because she dies horribly in the mirror universe. And so, I'm just not going to mention this mutiny. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Although I'm pretty sure people mutinied in the NX01. Didn't didn't read mutiny at one point or something? Wasn't there? Um, I, I know of the mirror universe episode there was a mutiny, very bad mutiny. But wasn't there mm. a mutiny once against somebody when they had like? I don't know. I feel like something happened in the NX01, maybe. I don't remember. Uh, but yeah, so who, who do you think's right? The Burnham question. The fact that she's a mutineer is bad for morale. <coughs> Although, to be honest, why are you telling the Federation at large that you've put Burnham on your secret, ultra high secret test ship? Why would that be public knowledge? It wouldn't be public knowledge. It would be knowledge among the admirals and some okay. captains. And I think that's what she's referring to because more people are starting to get it because it's filtering down. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, she did mention that, yeah, it's bad for morale to have her on board. But, and but The Admirals know for the greater good. It seems like a... It, it's a personal statement from her. I don't think she's really concerned about her Admirals. You know, take Red, yeah. off, take red Officers of 60 years, they're saying, Oh no! The war criminal is serving an important purpose on your ship. I feel like we'll lose the war now. Now. Yeah. yeah. It was, and he's like, "Oh well, I have the authority during yeah. war times to, you know, yeah. have whoever I want on if it'll help the course of the war." Mm -hmm. I love that. I love the like po politics there. Yeah, um, he's like, "Nope, and, there is a rule. I'm using yeah. it." End of story. <laughs> End of story. And and he's also uh, like, "Are you uncomfortable with the power I've been given?" Mm -hmm. Which there's something odd going on with the Lorca thing. How we got that and. We touch a little bit more on what happened later in the episode, but yeah. And she goes, "We we don't need to give people any more reason to not trust you." <laughs> I was like, "Wow, that's that's going to be something big to find out about." And then we kind of learn a little bit more I in mean, the episode. So. You kind of feel like he was no one's first choice because yeah. he was put well, in like, because well, like, like Ed Mercer. <laughs> he was no one's first choice, and yet one admiral overruled everyone else and said, "No, he's in charge." And everyone else is like, "Seriously, dude." You are wrong, but yeah. overrode like the Section Thirty One guy. You know, it's that yeah. sort of, yeah. Uh, and then Stuart, he's in a shuttle alone, coming from Starbase. Why? Why did he take a shuttle to the state space station? And why is the shuttle the not most, at warp? Yeah, this was the most confusing thing ever. I don't know if it's just bad writing or bad editing or just crunching for time. They had but like from... three ships in orbit of the station. Yeah, 
from him to from him to go, him to, go to that scene to in the sh- in the shuttle was literally like what happened. Okay, well he's in the shuttle now. Sweet. But why is it not <laughs> uh, a warp? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. There isn't a reason. And then Stuart, a as we uh, as we can see from the pictures, a Klingon D seven comes out of warp and tractor beams them, and they get boarded. Yes, it, yeah, and it was called a Class D seven battle cruiser. By the computer, which knows because the war has happened, they now know all the classifications of Klingon ships because they have now seen them for seven months. Yes, and I got to admit, when it came in and I saw like clean straight lines and it was kind of a close up of it, you couldn't really see the whole ship. I, I kind of got excited and a little giddy. I'm like, okay, there's a D seven now, and there isn't. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Stuart, the deflector rotates. We're going to talk about this in a full episode where we put yes. our real judgments of this. Quite interesting choice. But it's anyway, crazy. long story short, he gets kidnapped. Captain, Captain Lorca gets kidnapped, specifically targeted, and, uh, and you would you would think the captain of your most secure, most secret, most important ship, the one spearhead of the entire war, would not be sent on a shuttle, but would be sent on one of your three ships that are surrounding you, that can all go fast in the shuttle and have defenses. Yeah, convenience for convenience sake, and how? how how did the Klingons know he was there? And are, I'm assuming now the Klingons went into Federation space, knew where he was, knew where he was going, knew when he would be out of warp for no reason. Wow, I just I didn't even think about this when I was watching it. How? Neither the... did I. What? Did I. <sighs> what? The discovery wasn't, the discovery wasn't even in Klingon space. What? Nope. Yeah, it's very odd. So obviously there's a Klingon spy in the Federation. I mean, that's the, literally the only explanation. That's referred to later a little bit. Trust me, I'm, I got notes. That, notes. God, that's so lazy storytelling. I said specifically as it, it is. Wow, it is. I didn't it's... even think about that. It, it's so blatant in your face. I was so focused on D seven, but I didn't realize how. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Jeez. Okay. Anyway, well, yeah. At least it didn't. So... De- at least it didn't decloak. <laughs> at least it came out of warp. <laughs> yeah. Been even yeah. worse. Anyway, so discovery. Yeah, well, tells them real time communication across the galaxy that. Been kidnapped. Uh, Saru's not pleased. But they've got to rescue him. Aha. Yes. And then, of course, because of all the crap with Burnham, um, Saru's feeling kind of indecisive, I guess would be the good, a good word. He asked the computer to pull up a list of the mm. most decorated captains in Starfleet, either living or deceased. Mm-hmm. And then I have a real issue with the next screen. Really? We've got Captain Robert April, the first captain of the Constitution class Enterprise. Mm -hmm. We've got Captain Jonathan Archer, the first captain of the Enterprise. The founder of the Federation as well. We got Matt Decker, who later becomes Commodore Decker in the Doomsday Machine and then goes crazy. And then his son. Anyway, a long story. Anyway, then there's Philippa Giorgio, who died at Battle of Binary Stars. Who's in a terribly old ship that was never a particularly good captain that we saw on screen. Exactly. And then there's Captain Christopher Pike, who is currently in command of the Enterprise during this time period. This was fan service to the max, and I hated it. I, I love seeing familiar names, but there should have been at least two that we didn't recognize. Don't have everybody on there be three of them Enterprise captains, and everybody else somebody we know. Because remember, the captain is impartial. The captain doesn't know canon. I mean, the, the computer, sorry. So yes. the most decorated living order. So you're saying there was zero decorated captains between Jonathan Archer and Captain Giorgio. There was no captains that are worth mentioning. There should be at least three lines of ten names each. You know? Yes, that would have been much better. And you pick out cool names, there's a couple of names, maybe there's John Eves in there, there's a, you know, a couple of really <laughs> nice little Easter egg names. Mm. But yeah, I didn't think about that, but yeah, three Enterprise captains, and the Enterprise is not a special ship at this point, so there's no reason to have them bar the original, obviously. I mean, if if you want decorated, it should be all twelve Connie captains. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, but, yeah. But I know what people are going to say. They're going to be like, the reason that we hear the stories of all these captains is because they are the most famous. They are the most decorated. That's why we know the stories. Well, we never heard about all George the... Giorgio or I April, know. really, or John Archer after the after the Enterprise of X O One. So and only and Pike was never mentioned again. And Matt Deck- none of them were ever mentioned again, actually, beyond beyond TOS. So no, none of them are very, none of them are obviously legacy based. Yeah, it's 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 fan service, but they should have made it, they should have thought, okay, let's make it make sense first, and then put back in 
mm-hmm. Easter egg stuff rather than let's just throw out the six names people recognize and our captain because she's so great. She was not a great captain, guys. She didn't show any talent or skill. Apart from a survivor neck pinch that was done by a non label yeah. yeah. <sighs> well, we're, we're hung, hung, up, hung up on this point. Let's just move along. Although I will note, cause... look, Stuart, we've got a... They're moving towards TOS buttons. They've got an orange and a red button. It's not all blue anymore. That was yes. legitimately a thought I had, and I was like, yay, they're trying. Yes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> then they basically decide they're going to have to do multiple jumps in Klingon space to find Captain Lorca. So apparently he got deep into Klingon space at some point, somehow. Uh, I don't understand. Because, yeah, like you said, the Klingons would have had to come into Federation space, kidnap him, know where he was, and then get back over the border without during wartime. It just yeah, doesn't make sense. And because of, you know, the, the, the discoveries, obviously, in that same sector, I mean, it should be in the same sector, roughly, because it, it dropped them off. I mean, you know, they're, it's close. But the, I, I find it strange that their long-range sensors are so good that it can it can know, it can, you know, roughly work out which direction and assume that it's going to be correct. I mean, the Klingon ship doesn't have to go in a straight line. You know, and that's one plot point I hate in this one. They happen to jump in so close to the one ship they find, guessing it was in this area. Space is vast. Space is 3D. Why aren't they, you know, really high above it? Why aren't they, you know... They, I was expecting four, five, six, seven jumps to try and catch it. And then on their tenth jump, they get it. Mm-hmm. Not, first try, yay, we did it because we guessed based on long-range sensors. Why aren't the Klingons long-range censoring us? Why aren't, you know... It's a two-way street, guys. Yeah. You know, um, and again, this is all this is all <clears throat> plot convenience, but this is a 2017 show that's meant to be putting their best foot forward, mm-hmm. and therefore problems are more glaring when it's being, you know, they know it's going to be more scrutinised, they know it's going to be more legacy-based. Um, and, yeah, and i got to jump in and say that the computer's kind of sassy, because it asked for <laughs> the reason for, that he wanted to do this new procedure. What? He, ex- he explains it, and then the computer's like, well, just... Here's another suggestion: just remove the rogue element. And I, the look on his face, I was thinking, very tempting, but not an option. <laughs> I thought he would say very tempting, not an option, but yeah, why, just, he just said not an option. Why, why couldn't he just drop her off at the starbase now? Like he's now in command. He doesn't believe in her thing to drop her off. You know, then he wouldn't have to worry about her. It's obviously in shuttle range. <laughs> Funny. Oh, I'm serious. I mean, he's now in command. Oh, I know. I know. I mean, yeah. if that's if that's if if that's his biggest issue in the situation is she'll make me judge, you know, question myself. Really? She must. They they hate each other. The Shinju. You can tell. They were absolute bitter rivals. And that book, Desperate Hours, really goes into that relationship a lot more. I suggest you guys read it. So we wake up. He, Lorca wakes up in prison and gets introduced to hardcore Fenton Mud, but you can call him Harry. And we get given the entire backstory of Mud. <laughs> in one long speech. Yeah, we hear all about Stella, who mm-hmm. we see later. And, um, and uh, he mm-hmm. bought her a moon, but ran behind on his payments. <laughs> Had to take a, out a quadruple mortgage on the moon. And uh, he ran into yeah. Klingon space and got captured. Yes. yes. So what did you think? And I think we'll probably do an episode of this about, about as well, so we'll do summaries. What do you think about his portrayal of mud and this first Klingon bit? I was actually really impressed with this portrayal of mud. I wasn't sure what to expect with that, mm-hmm. um, but I was, I, I like his, I like his mud, uh, and we're going to see more of him. We absolutely know mm-hmm. we are. Well, we see, teaser clip. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I was, I was impressed too. He did a solid job. It's yeah. difficult to do that character because he is just like a classical piratey smugglery. Uh, it was very much the lines that gave him the character, and so how do you then create new lines for a younger character? that is not in the same place in his in his life. But yeah, I liked him. He was, yeah, I mean, a, a little bit douchey, but not too much. Um, I loved his beard. I didn't know the guy could grow that beard. That's a, that's a strong beard, that beard. Um, although I didn't, it seems strange that he would be on the ship still. Like, when was he captured? How long? I, I, I guess they go into why he's still there, and he hasn't been beaten up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is interesting. But that means... That means they must rotate through re- other prisoners pretty regularly. Uh, yeah, yeah. But last time I heard, um, the suggestion was to pray because the Klingons don't take prisoners. Lights. Oh, that's a different movie. Oh yeah, I I hadn't thought about the that. Klingons, 
Yeah, the Klingons don't take prisoners until they do, as you always say. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we're double... Ca- I mean, I, I mean mm. you remember in TOS, the, the other Klingons like, Take half them down as, pr- as my prisoners! Okay. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm fine. I don't care. I mean, fine. They, they do they do, do escape pods and they do, you know, they do have escape pods and they do take prisoners. It's fine. Different Klingons, different... I mean, come on, 24 houses that look radically different. You're allowed to have different uh, morals. Um... So yeah, we're introduced to this other crewman who we didn't get a name or a rank, he just dies, so end of end of story. And I will say, when this Klingon chap go comes in, the the I guess the, the torture, although his torture is pretty light class, which is beating people up, I thought, oh his head ridges, that's good. And he had a very, very small head. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that mm-hmm. might be the closest Klingon we've had to real Klingon. And his armor's cool, but not very Klingony. Like, I liked it. Yeah. I, I'm uh, glad to see a different version than the spikes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, and I, I, the first thing they say when they come in is "choose your pain," and that's the whole thing. The prison, and that, that's what Mary, Harry explains. Yeah, but you go into that. That's quite a big part of the story in this. You get to choose what happens to you, basically, when the Kling- when Klingons come in. So you point to the other prisoner. It's it's a way to establish n- not antitrust. You you can't trust your other uh, inmates, your cellmates, and get a bond with them because they're going to sell you out because they don't want to get. It seems odd to me, but. <sighs> yeah, doesn't seem like something the Klingons would do necessarily. Well, the, the problem is, means you always need three prisoners in the room because if you if you have two and the guy and one guy chooses the other guy, he gets stamped to death. There's no trust anyway because he's just killed them. So you have to have three, but then if the one guy is going to pick the the third oh. guy the next time, then the trust is broken again. I mean, I, I, well, the the other guy that comes in says that he had time to heal. They give them time to heal up. Yes. So then they would throw them back in, so they'd be they rotate them, and but then eventually they just stamp, kill them. But he was going to stamp the guy's head, though. That was that was an important little visual yeah. repeated piece. And it yeah. seems strange. Who 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 is the Klingon choosing to choose? Like if you let if you let the same guy choose every time, he's just not going <laughs> to choose himself. I mean, do you? Just, yeah. But if you choose if you choose the other guy, so he's going to be beaten. He's going to pick mud. And then mud dies. So you've got to pick mud every time for the strategy to work. But then, have you noticed that he's not at all hurt? I mean, you said he healed up, but it. We'll put it this way: it's not a strategy that has honor, and it's kind of a flawed strategy in and of itself. Um, yeah. But these Klingons don't seem to have honor anyway. I, I and, mentioned last time these Klingons are clearly at a time when their culture has diminished. They are less than they were in in, in will be in TOS, less than they were in Enterprise. You know, this is a very uh, degraded Klingon culture, so honor is obviously not as important of a thing. Mm-hmm. And there's a bit of a plot hole of the writing there because, yeah, even Lorca makes a point of saying to Mud that he has, he doesn't, I don't see any bruises on you. Uh, it just, it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem logical or practical that he wouldn't have at least a few bruises. But anyway. Uh, but yes, they kill the guy <clears throat> and they're very sad. And then we're back on the Discovery and we bring Burnham. We're trying, we're trying to convince Stamets to, you know, stop work on the, uh, working mm-hmm. on the, uh, the, uh, beast mm-hmm. and i gotta admit i love stamets uh, attitude here uh and even the relationship between the doctor and stamets you kind of get the f- the first hints of that here well yeah i kind of got it in the f- first episode we saw the doctor we were suspicious as to whether they were the couple um but here it's like yeah please show me how to talk to him because i can't talk to him and then she like compliments his work <laughs> and then and he's like yeah, I just I love Stamets. His character is amazing. I, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more from him. So yeah, I kind of liked him less in this episode because uh, oh, in, really? in this scene when he got more lighthearted, he was great. But he was, I think I wrote, he was Stamets is a real B to his partner. Yeah, you know, he he rarely listens to me. Okay, that's not great. And and he's just he's just he's just mean to him for no real reason. Then basically says f off. He, in they're not public, a good, they're not a good couple. These two, they don't respect each are. other. I think they do very much. You just don't see it. And Stamets doesn't want to show it. No, this scene of... is just badly written. That's the thing. The, ah. Later on, they're better. This scene is, they're not, it's too far. Like, if, you, if your partner, but if, you partner, if your partner walked in, trying to help you, and you said, get out of here, now. <laughs> Bye, dear. I mean, your other partner would be like, basically, they, they're very resilient people to be able to deal with each other, because the doctor's obviously <laughs> much nicer. And Stamets is obviously in his work. I just... This one scene is... I mean, if, if you did not know from the production teaser and stuff they were a couple, you would, the, the end scene would be a surprise based on this scene. You know, we can infer because yeah. we knew in advance. You would not have been able to guess otherwise, um, despite the the subtext of, he really listens to me, but that could be, mm-hmm. for, that could be 
friends you know it could yeah. be trip and malcolm rather than lovers so yeah um but yeah then we hear about he has to go help the cmo with the end or during tonsillectomy <clears throat> and why are we not seeing andorians why do we keep seeing new races please show us the familiar races that you don't change please yes. please show us the canon races please so then we get a surprise introduction of a guy that mm -hmm. was in the room, but they didn't notice. Well, we might have put him back in. They might have put, they I probably, don't know. Well, anyway. he probably, he wouldn't have been surprised there, would he, by seeing him being no. dragged in. But that's true, that's true. He, he was asleep in the corner, it's fine. So, and Lieutenant Ash Taylor, and this is the guy I was talking about in the last review, mm -hmm. that we hadn't seen yet, and I was w interested to see when he would be introduced to the crew, because we know he's a regular crew member of Discovery. Mm -hmm. Um... And he said he's been there seven months. He got captured at the Battle of Binary Stars. He was aboard the USS Jaeger mm -hmm. when it went down. And hopefully the Jaeger in this reality isn't as ugly as the one from the Prime timeline. But that's a whole other story. Although, question. Yes. We saw pretty much that entire battle, and the Klingons absolutely wiped the floor of the Federation. But that means they did... They, the egg was destroyed. They took prisoners. The the ships that survived that walked away, they because the sarcophagus ship didn't take prisoners because they would have eaten them, and they did eat Giorgio. It was the other ships. <clears throat> so do they? I mean, they just beamed them aboard. So I guess they just took a plethora of clean, uh, human prisoners. But that's quite interesting. Like, mm. you know, the first battle they take like hundreds of prisoners potentially or whoever's left. Um, we'll say loved his introduction. Um, very mm -hmm. solid character, uh, mm -hmm. and and sort of skip closer to the end. You know, he's sacrificing himself. He's willing. He is a very He's a very by-the-book officer, but you like that he's doing it for a real reason. And for seven seven months of torture, he's doing very well, which obviously uh -huh. brings into other other concepts. And he does mention that he's the, the Klingon lady, who's the Klingon lady from the previous uh -huh. episodes, is a bit friendly on him. And based on her reaction in the later scenes, they're a bit friendly-friendly. Is it the same Klingon from the last episode? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Same actress, yeah. I didn't get that at all. She, oh, yeah. Well, she's wearing the same armor, the same, yeah. I just thought it, it was it's a, a different cat. Oh, my God. Name. Yeah, she she left. Well, I, I thought it was a bit convenient as well. Why'd she leave her, you know, savior chap? But Because she, she needs to look like she's on the other side. Because she even said in the last episode, he's, it's not going to take him long to realize Ooh. that I left, that I took a raider. Ooh. So she's... She's helping him out, but at the same time staying uh, on the good side of the yeah. Can, yeah, and obviously she's the she's probably a second in command, third in command. So this is an important mission to you know capture and torture Lorca. So that makes sense. But yeah, it's yeah. it's her, and it's weird that you know he kind of you got some subtext between her and the other guy, but yet it, she wants a boy toy human. <laughs> yeah, well, boy toy human. I mean, they're there. Mm -hmm. Why not? No. And then Lorca asks although, him... Although, although, sorry, one more thing. Yeah. She's only been in command of that ship for a month. So he had six months of torture. He survived six months without being a boy toy, and then became a boy toy for the last month. She wasn't obviously in the war for those other months. That's, that's why I didn't think it was her. That's why I thought it was just a regular... Uh, another female captain. Mm -mm. Okay, well, that's another writing plot hole, I guess, but... Interesting, nonetheless. He should be a lot more. He should be a lot more destroyed as a person for six months of Cleon torture. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And then one month of fine. And then Lorca asked him, do you know anything about the ship? You must have found out the layout. What's the crew complement? 30 to 40. Oh, yeah. On a D7, which is also referred to as a prison ship. And they misidentify as a bird of prey later on. But they don't, yep, they don't know, I, they don't know, I, they don't know I, what ship it is. But That's in my notes, and I'll get to that when we get to so that. I'm, but... I'm guessing this is a D7 prisoner variant? Sure. That's exactly what it is. But Klingons don't take prisoners. Except for when they do. Yes, on the, the dedicated prison <laughs> transports. Yes. Well, third, you would think prison transports would have more than 30 guards just in general, because it's meant to be a big ship. It's not, based on the size yeah. of the sea. But 30 prisons, I mean, and they also shot like nine people in the last scene, so he killed like a fifth of the crew. <laughs> mm. <sighs> but anyway, next thing that happens, a little bug comes in with food for hardcore Fenton Mud. Did you hear what the bug was named? Charles? No. Stuart. Yes. The bug's name was Stuart, and I'm like, is that disrespect from the Discovery people? Is that like a little hint that, uh, you know, Trek Yards guys are, you know, spilling information? Uh, the, the, I'm, the, I'm glad they didn't name it Captain Foley. I'm just, I'm just wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought this was a really interesting scene, though, uh, and they ask, you know, you take food out of the, ma out of the men that's between you and death, you bet I would. 
They just shouldn't they just beat him up at this point? I mean, there's no reason not to hit him. I mean, Lorca seems like the guy that would just walk over there, mm-hmm. punch him in the face, get the food, eat it, punch him again, sit down. He's not the sort of guy to resist. Mm-hmm. You know, ha- just because Harry is arrogant and fun. Yeah. You know, um, but it's cool. Mm-hmm. Although, what, a, what an absolute D, but as we know, it's, it's a cover. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that in a minute. That's um, right. And what do you think about the, the whole, the, the double subplot story where he says about Starfleet arrogance? You know, ever wonder about little people? There's more of us down there than up here. What did you think about that whole thing? I really like that line because it's yep. true. Um, mm-hmm. There is a lot more of them than there is a Starfleet up mm-hmm. above. And not everybody has such a, you know, Starfleet's not the the white in night ar- or the the knight in shining armor coming to yep. save the day all the time. There are a lot of a lot of times causing the problems, at least from other people's point of view. That's the reason we're in a war right now. That's the reason, you know. Um, so, you know, boldly going where no man has gone before has got its dangers, and uh, oh, we've heard that bef- heard that before once or twice in yeah. Star Trek, where Starfleet gets blamed for that kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And he was very careful to say no one has gone before. Yeah, yeah. He he had a lot of good scenes. They obviously enjoyed writing for him, and I think that's why he he sold me on his his portrayal. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> End of my notes. Then we have a very really strange scene. I don't know if you agree. I loved this scene so much. Okay, you start. First of all, we see Michael Stamet or Burnham Stamets and Tilly, and good they're talking three. about the ter- yeah, they have good the chemistry. Ta- three of them. Absolutely, and they're talking about the tardigrade. Uh, and how they need to transfer transfer its DNA into another living organism or find a compatible DNA so that they can use that instead of the Ripper for um, using uh, being a navigator because the, the Ripper's starting to kind of fall apart. Um, and <laughs> make a note of it. Make a note of it because my brother, my brother messaged me before I watched the episode. And he goes, 51 years of Star Trek... And the F word finally made its way into a script. Because Tilly's like, F yeah, that's cool. And then Stamets agreed with her and said it again. I love this scene, first of all. It gives more of Tilly's character some, you know, realism, some excitement. And Stamets uh, saying it again, I mean, I just, I thought it was awesome. A lot of people were complaining about the F word being used from what, from what I saw online. I like it. Why would it not still be a euphemism in the future? It's not that far in the future. You know? Um, so what did you think? Did, did you not like the, the use uh, of that? So the scene, this is where Stamets was really good. Being energetic, be sciencey, be happy. He plays his best when he's that but with that little bit darker undertone i felt mm. this scene is meant to this series is meant to have a long stream continuity yet they've continuously re-explained the plot as if it's a week-on-week show and i was mm. like guys please do not re-explain the entire premise of the device again for a fourth time please stop wasting my time until you're right at the end but you didn't need that it was cool but that could be in the first episode it was mm-hmm. stupid again, and then suddenly F bomb comes out. I'm like, wow, Star Trek's just got denigrated a little bit. Swearing needs to no swearing needs to be for a reason, and that wasn't she's, made enough reason. She could she's say not any swear word. She's socially awkward though. I know, I know, but they they've said before the show even started a year ago it was going to be darker and have more adult content, um, and people yeah, were, were, were people now, were afraid that was going to be nudity and stuff like. Well, that's Game what I mean. Why, why not? Why not have tits now? Because, you know, it's powerful to see. You know, she gets killed in the shower. Oh, no. It's like, mm, does not... Mm. I have no problem with it, is what I'm saying. I understand why people do, it, but... I just problem, think it brings brings a sense of realism to it, that for, for me, anyway. My so. problem is it just, just it didn't need to be there. You know? It didn't need to be, no, but... Um, and they, 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 they forcibly put it in. Um, like, the, the, the character could have said anything else. Like, she could have jumped on and said, Oh, that's so cool! Or, oh, I bloody love it! You know, the scene could have been done better with better things. Or say frack. Or make up a new swear word. You know, like BSG. Let's use, let's use even more. If you want to have a swear word... Or it would have been good one. for her to say, Heck, that's cool. And he'd be like, Hell yeah, that's cool. You know, yeah, kind of I mean, trump, well, trump her heck with the hell. Yeah. Yeah, that would have or actually... Bloody kind of hell. Been you know, or, you know, yeah. all the swear words that aren't the big one. Just because it doesn't add anything to the scene... Yeah, and like you say, uh, you know, it... 
I have no issue with it. I thought it was funny. I thought uh, I enjoyed it personally, but it's like person. it's like if you know, it would have been fun if you know there's a scene where every fellowship's getting annihilated and 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 Captain Locke's like, oh. I'm sure we might see that still. Yeah, that's that's like that's a scene where you can tell everything has come down to the line, but not he's so so excited. I mean, it just again didn't need it, so it wasn't justified. So it's just there to make you go, oh my god. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, think, I think we'll see a use of it again. But and then we get an off uh, shot of the D7 inverted commas. Let's move on. Uh, torch <laughs> weapons and yeah, like I say, uh, the Klingon. Uh, well, uh, torch. I gotta make a. I gotta make a point here. Oh. I love the Klingon speaking English. Thank God that she's speaking English. Um, and then she's he comments on her English how good it is, and she goes, "Well, I'm descendant from I'm a descendant from spies." And I just wrote nice because I think that was a little nod to the whole FASA has Klingon spies um, infiltrating Federation space. That's why they look like humans. I thought that was just a nice little nod, and plus. Spies, how did they know about his shuttle trip? <clears throat> Which admiral in that room was one of the spies that <laughs> helped him out? Well, exactly. I mean, this is a top, 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 top secret situation, isn't it? I mean, this is not... Mm-hmm. They would only know... They would go, they'd be the only ones that know he was there, let alone where he's going and how he's getting back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think the spies is going to come in very soon um, and be a, be a big thing. I hope so. I mean, that's an excellent plot point, and I think they should run with it. And then she forces his eyes open and basically blinds him. So what I'm sim- wondering. What a simple and elegant torture, though. This is your weakness. Here's your light. Ah! But I'm wondering if it's going to cause more damage to his eyes. I was thinking uh, that, the, yeah. Through the course of the series. And I wonder if he's actually going to have to get the artificial eyes later. Yeah. And how much that's going to affect his character because he doesn't want the artificial eyes. Anyway, back on the Discovery, Stuart. Then we get this great little star map and we see some great references to Repenthe and K7. Rupente and K7, yes, but Rupente is their prison planet. It would be deep within Klingon space, not that close to the border. K7, perfect placement. You know, that border can change a little bit, get closer to K7 during the course of the 10 years before TOS. Anyway, the next scene. Um, Michael Burnham is bucking the chain of command, and they're looking for new Mm -hmm. DNA. And Tilly asks, should we check the classified databank? Because we can't find anything in the regular databank. To which Seru comes in and says, no, absolutely not. Yeah, he was... Yeah. Uh, and it was the Daystrom Institute classified, which is pretty interesting. Yes, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> not, not much goes on in that scene, so... <laughs> yeah, although I was kind of surprised, because they specifically mentioned, oh, no, we can we can give a new spore drive operator, and it can be a human, because we're close, so, and here's the injectable device, so we've now solved the entire issue. This plot, I mean, this show is literally every episode they've, they've created a problem. We can only go 10 meters of spore drive. Boom, now we've got a ta- um, yeah. creature. Oh no, the creature's being hurt. Now we can make any human but link not. to link. To, I know we haven't got the, the repercussions yet, but obviously, if any person can link this network. But not long term. I think that's the point. <sighs> like one or two jumps, maybe. But that's even. But then it's even better, because it means if it's not going to hurt them physically. I know we, I know the end scene, but it it's really easy. I know these are meant to be really the best of the best. Yeah. But if it's that easy, they would revisit this technology. There's got to be a mind-bogglingly epic reason this technology is never mentioned again, because they are fixing it. I mean, you said last time, it it must have a flaw. Oh no, it works. It works flawlessly, and they can and they know exactly how the the the, the ta- tardigrade is linking to it they know exactly how the science works and they can know exactly how to link it to a person i mean they're geniuses and it's really easy it's e- ways and it should have been but next scene uh the stewart bug <laughs> it's found it's out <gasps> name's stewart and it's literally a bug it's got a bugging a tr- device a tarantula. oh <laughs> yeah yeah huh. nice yeah i know right and what do you think of this plot reveal which one? How about Lorca? All of them. Tell me all your thoughts. Um, I thought... Well, I'm going to go into the, the big one. I don't know if there's something else you want to talk about here. Well, Mud um, being a spy. I mean... <laughs> Mud giving information to the Klingons. We didn't know that. So I don't think he knew he was being a spy. I think they sent the bug in with the bug. And he thought he was just... I, don't th- I think he was duped into 
He's accepting food really? from this bug. Yes, I do. I don't think he was... Oh, I got the exact opposite. That's the only reason he's not been beaten up. The only reason he survived all this time is because well, that, he helped they... them. No, because they're letting him stay alive because they know because they know he's dumb enough to fall to to fall for this bug, which is literally a bug, listening in on all their conversations, because he wants to be able to steal food from other people, and the bug is providing that. I think, I don't think he was really working with the Klingons. I don't think that's something Mud would necessarily do. I mean, he's self. That's why it surprised is, me. That's why it surprised me. It was like it doesn't seem, but then it does always. But he's also very self preservation like yeah self-preservation is his thing but at the same time i don't think i just think he's he got duped into it that's what i think i'll tell you what let, let's agree it was ambiguous it could be the way and we'll see later yeah, yeah so anyway the next plot point oh, we find out about Lorca. um he was the only survivor of a ship the us uss baran um and he destroyed his crew to prevent them from falling into klingon's hands and being tortured on chronos uh, kind of on Captain like <laughs> to be the only survivor and to destroy your crew. Well, it opens up more questions. I mean, what possible situation where he's the only one to either leave the ship ahead of whatever happens and then the crew gets almost destroyed, or the mm. crew is captured, he's he's allowed to run free and he turns himself to strap and he escapes out trying to save anybody. Either way, he's a coward. He's trying to he's trying to justify it to himself. Um, he's sort of doing a good thing, but also not really because he murdered everybody. And it might be a big crew because everyone's you know, it's a very strange situation. It, it opens up more. I mean, what do you think? Is it good, bad? Does it justify who he is, what he's doing? I, yeah. See, I, see, I don't know. We need we need to learn more about the situation because the way it's described, it's yet yeah, something fishy is going on. He. Again, he's acting under self-preservation rules there, but that's not a captain thing to do. Um, you go down with your ship, you make sure your crew's safe before yourself, you know, that kind of thing. And he did the exact opposite. It's almost <laughs> like a Commodore Decker type of deal. Commodore Decker left the ship thinking that the Doomsday Machine would go after him uh, and, uh, you know, beamed his crew to the planet or whatever, and then the Doomsday Machine destroyed it, and he was destroyed by that. Lorca could be the same type of situation he tried to save his crew and it turned out bad and it turns out he was the only survivor which would look bad in other people's eyes and i think that's probably the case because he is a starfleet captain you don't get to that position by i don't know i i, I think we're going to learn definitely more about that and find out exactly what happened yeah it, it sounds bad i don't want to judge him yet because it sounds too bad you know we don't know any of this we don't know any of the details of the situation i really hope they've thought it through but it makes me think, though, that whatever was happening... I mean, they picked him to yeah. lead the super secret mission, and they didn't relieve him, whatever, when he got the, the thing working. They thought he was not only good for the research of it, but also for the, the execution of this ship. My my take from that might have been that something happened with his crew, with his ship, that he learned some Klingon secrets, and he knew these have got to get home. I can't mm. send them by real-time hologram because that system is damaged. Mm -hmm. I have to physically uh, escape, so I'm going to take the last shuttle and set and push the other pilot out of the way so I can get there first. Not really, but he escaped, um, mm -hmm. knowing that he had to save trillions and to stop the D7 from the B7 from destroying, from gaining information, he had to self-destruct his own ship uh, and he couldn't alert them by sending escape pods. So, he, uh, so the ends justify the means and the greater good. And that's the only reason I can see them using him because he, he's been proven to disregard the human life of the moment to save the Federation. The, the ultimate needs of the many ends. Yeah. Outweigh the needs of the few. Even your friends, even your crew, even your family, yeah. even your command, you are willing to sacrifice everyone you know and love for the greater ideals of the Federation, even if you destroy those ideals by doing it. Yeah. Which is makes him a very capable officer to pick... Yeah, no, those, those three guys are going to get killed if we close this bulkhead. I'm doing it myself. I'm physically pressing the button. They are now going to die. Yep, let's walk away. It's okay. Save the Federation. It makes us better. Day. I love your song and dance. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sounds cool. <laughs> Good to see backstory. And so Saru says, right, let's yeah. let's let's get towards, uh, let's try and save him. We've, we've pinpointed his location. I have three possible direct trajectories all going through roughly the same space. If you look at the map, they're pretty damn distant from each other, those paths. Um, and space is pretty vast. So the luck of this scene is pretty incredible. 
and they beam the uh, Tardigrade in the thing. And, and again, sound... lots, I yeah. gotta say, jump in there, a lot of TOS sound effects in this yeah. scene from the communications, mm -hmm. yeah. from the communications chirp to the transporter. Yeah. Love that. And if you look at the close up of the panel, you see little controls for drive one, main control, drive three, drive five. Um, so how many drives are on this thing? I mean, it's probably all those canisters behind them. But I just thought that was interesting to point that yeah. out. And so they, they jump, and the uh, Tardigrade is not doing well. It actually kind of... I was I was really surprised by this moment, and actually I was like, aww. Mm. Well, I went into hibernation. I went into survival mode. Uh, basically got rid of all of its water. 90%. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and then we hear uh, Saru uh, <laughs> yeah. talking to um, Stamets and the Doctor about this. In, in front of everyone as well. They didn't pull them to the crew yeah. to, to the quarters. They assumed, you know, they're going to they're gonna have a beat down on me. I'm going to beat them right back down and say, no, you listen to me, guys. I'm the captain. I don't care about life, the universe, or anything. I just care about the captain. <laughs> And the doctor's like, I'm not going to, you know, cause any harm. And he's like, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking mm -hmm. to the engineer. I want to know if you can get us to jump. Because it really serves. And Saru points out here, too, I'm responsible for 134 souls. So we now know the crew complement of the Discovery. Wow. It's a small crew. It's a small ship, I think. So everyone has three science jobs. <laughs> It's capable of doing 300 scientific True. experiments. I was blown away by that. That's like intrepid class. That's like, you know, yeah. Nova class plus a little bit. I want to do a whole episode on that to compare that. I mean, for the, and someone pointed out on Facebook after I, you know, saw the episode, it basically means that most of the saucer is is the, the, the rotating wings. Like, there isn't much livable space in this ship, actually. It's Should science be. labs. I mean, you still need to have quarters for everyone. And the fact if they're doubling up quarters... They obviously need to double up, so they might only have, you know, 75 quarters, um, mm. plus a few for senior staff, and the rest of it is just technology. You know, that's a tiny crew for this. Although, not a good size crew for a war for the tip of the spear warship. And if you and if you look back, I'm sure, based on people on the bridge and the extras we've seen, we might have seen at least 60 of the people on the ship ready, in terms of crew yeah. members. That's pretty, pretty a lot. Yeah. But I was. Yeah. How did you feel though? Going back a step, how did you feel about the um, Tardigrade being disabled? Like they had one jump left in them, despite you know. Like that's why I hope they've jumped to multiple locations because they'd push it in a short space of time. But they had one jump left, mm -hmm. and it, it. You know, what do you think about it being like? That's it. You you've lost the ability to do that straight away. Mm. Like you had that on the brink. Well, we did, I guess they didn't know how close to the brink they were with with the tardigrade. I mean, I think Michael Burnham did. I think maybe Stamets did, but I think yeah, no I, one, it, I think there would have been more. Like, <clears throat> no, you can't do it again. One more, and he'll he'll go into hyper. Like one more, and he might die. Like they said, he had almost almost non visible life signs. Yeah, like that was a serious reaction. Um, yeah, I was really surprised by how. I and mean, they wanted to create more tension in the story. Obviously, and create the next part of the plot. But yeah. I was like, really? He's already out out of commission. But, um, but you're right. Like ten jumps within, you know, looking for them in a small amount of time. I think a would have broken the rules that the admiral set out initially to downgrade the yeah. use of the yep. spore drive, yep. and maybe cause some problems later. And mm -hmm. b would have really put a strain on the tardigrade. I think that would have made a lot more sense writing wise. Yeah. Because um, how lucky were they? Yeah. The one jump they had, and they went 0.7 AUs to the ship. And they did not have enough resources to know where it was inside Klingon space. I mean, sensors can only go so far. I mean, if, if you're on one side of the Romulan neutral zone, you can't detect into Romulan space. Like, yeah. you know, there's a certain limit to the range. Um, but anyway, <coughs> so the Klingons come and try and torture the guys again. And we get this great scene of, of these the other officers sacrificing himself, but not really. Pick me, Captain. And Lorca points at him. I wrote down, <clears throat> very uncaptain like <clears throat> To actually do that because no captain would do that. I thought he would. Kirk, would, Kirk yeah. would never do that. Kirk would be like, "No, you take me." Yeah, I was expecting straight away. Like, no, do, I mean, the plan would be the same either way. I mean, it wouldn't have affected well, the plan really. Oh, well, not necessarily. It might throw the Klingons off. Going, really, the captain? Okay. 
<laughs> they've had mud every time saying someone else, so they're, they're used to that sort of non. Yeah, but they're not used to captains doing that. Captains don't do that in Starfleet. Klingons would know that. Care. I just want to kill them. I don't care really. But anyway, it turns out to be an awesome escape plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get they get the disruptors, <clears throat> which are very cool, by the way. <laughs> um, I mean, we've seen them before, but to actually see a disruptor being used, that's brutal. I mean, we know disruptors cause disruption in the body, and they're very painful. But when you see that, they, you see that effect of them hitting people with that. It's like, wow, that does look painful. And then, and then they're also a double double edged weapon almost because they got the, the disruptor and stabby bits like a mm-hmm. bayonet. So it's used for close combat. I like that. I like that about that that weapon. I think this is a great idea and a great addition to the Klingon arsenal, in my opinion. Well, I think we said that at the time. It, it's very practical. Yeah. They love hand hand weapons, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And what do you think about leaving mud? <laughs> um uh, again, kind of on Starfleet like, because he is a human. Yeah. But I can see why Lorca did it, because Lorca thinks that he was working with the Klingons, so he wouldn't be the, the, well, uh, it's, it's a double edged sword, pun the, the weapon pun. You know, mm-hmm. you, if you take him with you, you can interrogate him yourself and get information that he might know. And if he's a spy for Klingons, he might know more. And he's been on the ship for months, whatever. <clears throat> um, if you leave him, he'll die. And mm-hmm. you're a bit of a B astard. I mean, again, well, very. You know, if you think he's working with the Klingons, he's not going to die because they're going to make sure yeah, he doesn't but, die. It annoyed me once again that that Red Guard had the ceremonial armor from Kuvmar's ship. They wouldn't be using that armor. This is not one of his fleet ships. This is, you know, those. Yeah, but I think we've established that the, the Kuvama thing, and it's not really ancient armor. It's just typical Klingon armor. They've kind of gone with that, even though we were told that it was anyway. Um, I gotta say though, I love the interior of the Klingon ship. I love the mm. darkness. The uh, the details are very nice. Um, it would have been very D7, it would have been very Katingri if the light of the lights on top had been doing red light down below and had created a great effect. Then it would have been Katinga, uh-huh. like, wouldn't have thought twice. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, um, and then he fires at the captain who gets burned on her face. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. Was yeah. Interesting. So Lorca actually made two enemies that in <sighs> one day. Because she's going to come back, that's going to bite him in the ass as well. Because she's not dead, she's coming back for sure, and she's going to want vengeance. Yeah, and what did you think about her unarmed walking up to the escaping people that she, I guess, knew were escaping somehow, and said, "But what are all we've been through, you can't leave me." Clingy, Klingon, or what? <laughs> yeah, she's a Klingon. <laughs> I, I out of yeah, especially because we, we say have a subplot with her and the other guy in the previous episode. It's weird that she'd be so infatuated after a month with a human. That's why I don't think it's her. I honestly don't think it's no, the it same is. character. No, it is. It's the same actress. It's the, the actress is in the credits. I, I don't care. I don't think it's supposed to be the same character, though. I really don't. It doesn't make sense for her to be the same character. And, and it's interesting to note that the disruptor didn't actually hit her. It hit the wall mm-hmm. that had supercharged spike, sparks. Very difficult to see. But yeah. yeah, I mean, and very gruesome. That I was not expecting real damage. That is a really gruesome and really. I mean, that's very like um, end of Star Trek: uh, The Wrath of Khan. Like that sort of I will avenge. That's cool. That was dark, but it was cool. And then they steal these uh, little fighters, which look very, very cool, but they don't look clean on them. Uh, and they're called raiders. But. We've done an episode on talking about that design, so... Yeah, this confused me no end. Um, uh, seeing the top view, it's a dragonfly, uh, and they've got wings up. Mm-hmm. It, this design's come out of nowhere, and has nothing connecting to Klingon design whatsoever. It has a full canopy. Mm-hmm. It's just bad design. I mean, not the, again, the design itself is not bad, but it's it's just... And also, the, the L-car screen is not at all Klingon-y. Um, yeah, this one is, again, totally out of left field. Uh, to think this is the fighters of the D7, and then you then you put the two designs side by side, like, no, it's not a D7, these are not so, fighters of D7. Yeah, pr- prison ships now have fighters, so prison ships are also fighter squadrons. And ships. so 32 people, two crewmen each, so you've just killed four people, six people, they've got a few pilots of the ship, and you've got 12 in these ships, so you had six following them, so they've now got no, no one on the ship left. Yay! 32 people. Um, yeah. 
And then Saru figures out that it's the captain because of the way that uh, the ship is maneuvering. Mm. And that's very awesome on Saru's part. So they, they contact them. And this line I really like when Lorca's like, the Calvary showed up. Um, you know, Lork, this is Captain Lorca, two to beam out. It was very cowboy like. Mm, oh, yeah. That's Straight exactly what point. I thought. That's what I yeah. thought. Very cowboy. The Calvary's here, beam us out. Just the way he delivered that line. And that goes back to Gene Roddenberry's original vision, the wagon train to the stars, because yeah. I just love that. That was a nice little yeah. nod, I think. So I have a couple of problems with this scene. Of course you do. I knew you would. <laughs> just, just plot things. Um, so they make a big deal of um, we... They haven't detected us. And they haven't just scanned us. Uh, but now they're in now the weapons range. Oh no, um, we can't... We can't... Um, we'll initiate... Oh, sorry. We will um, initiate a communication, we'll reveal our position. Excuse me? Um, you're literally visible distance. They've all got canopies. We can see you, they can see you. They're flying towards you. Lorca's flying towards you. Does, like, he, does he know they're there? They're in dark mode. Because he, he wouldn't know they were there because he doesn't know they're following them. He hasn't sent a signal. So he's flying in the right direction towards the Discovery who they can't detect even though they're visibly can detect them. And they're worried about them not detecting them. And then... It's like, and then they are after weapons range, then they shoot, but that's a problem with having windows that shouldn't be there. You can see the discovery, you know it's there. Why is anyone surprised? Why is anyone trying to keep a secret when it's right there? We can see them in the shots. Just, you know, lazy storytelling again. Um, mm. And if you note, there's a little uh, shot I did where you see graphics. They're using the Bird of Prey logo graphics rather than Raptor graphics, specifically. Mm -hmm. So the discovery is mislabeling these ships. Because spaceships can make mistakes. Just a little note there. Uh, and then they get beamed in, as you said. I love the little console. Transporter room. I mean, this was the, this is a good transporter yeah, this, room for, for this, the part. This scene make me, made me squee, squee a little bit. I was, I was a little bit excited to first see the transporter room. Yeah. And have such a great introduction to yeah. it. You see the standard console with the little shield, the yeah. thing that they have. Yeah. And uh, then you pan over and it's like it's original so series sound effects and just, oh. But yeah, so then Stamets is revealed. He used the spore drive. He mm -hmm. um, gets amazing close-up of Saru, which looks really weird. Just a little note. It's like, who hey, my the camera? I thought it was kind of funny. Um, what do you think about this reveal? Uh, or should, well, not really. But is it a reveal? Is it not a reveal? Hmm. About Stamets? Yeah, because he's like... Oh. Uh, it, it, you know, I, it, yeah. I expected it when they called down to the engineering room and said, is the, is the tardigrade oh. ready? And he's like, we're ready to jump. He didn't answer the question. Yep. He just said we're ready to jump. I knew somebody was going to be in there. I thought it might be Michael Burnham because I, of yeah. her dream sequence at the beginning, kind of yeah. foreshadowing. Yeah. But um, at the same time, I thought it's either Michael or him. I'm kind of leaning towards him right now. Um, so I wasn't super surprised about it. But it, yeah, pretty awesome, actually. Something he, something his character would definitely do because um, he cares about his technology. He wants to make sure the ship is safe. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I like it. I thought, I thought it was well done. Uh, so let's just burn through this next scene. So Saru uh, has a conversation. They sort of apologize. Gives her the gives him the telescope. Awesome. He finally asks for her help. And the yeah, help... and that's. Oh, oh so I gotta say that's the first real uh, olive branch that Burnham has handed to Saru, and it's actually a genuine character development yeah. moment, which I was hoping for in the last time when she used him, and then just yep. immediately. Yep. But this is the first kind of real progress as far as her character development goes so i actually like that she's they're they're humanizing her a bit and uh that i like so anyway then they released the tardigrade with some spores and yes the... you like come on surely as a, as a as a as a human thing to do yeah absolutely um and it was cool how the tardigrade kind of jumped into yeah. like where to go man I, th I have i and i have a feeling too we're gonna see this tardigrade show up again to save the day it's going to come back. It's one of those things, if you love something, let it go. If it comes back to you, it really loved you. And I think that's what's going to happen with this. They're going to be in hot water, and this tardigrade is going to come back and help them out. I have a feeling. Mark my words. So it'll be super deus ex tardigrade can transport anywhere in the universe. Tardigrade. Yes. Um, the next yeah. scene, to get them brushing their teeth and having a real, you know, couples moment, which is nice. Uh, and I do like, I do like the sonic, I do like the sonic toothbrushes yes. to go with the sonic shower. So using sound waves to clean their teeth, I think that's amazing. Awesome. It was a very human scene. 
But yeah. you had a you had a TOS communicate a uh, tricorder scanny thing that actually rotated almost one for mm-hmm. one what the re- real one is. Mm-hmm. Um, although I was a, a bit annoyed that the pad again had a Starfleet symbol on. It's like guys, don't brand everything, please. You don't need to, please. Yeah. Uh, and I and as soon as I saw them wearing the same shirt, I was like, oh, there are a couple already. That's. I thought they were gonna fall in love in the show to make it make more sense, but no, they're in love. They're together. I don't have a problem with that. I, 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 I thought there was something going on when he was treating his nose and they had that little banter no one, back and forth. No, no, he said that, but I assumed it was the, we've got some chemistry, we'll go into it. Like, I, no. I wouldn't want to be in this couple. It, it, it's not a healthy relationship, as been shown. And it just seems weird to jump to it, because it would have been so nice if they started dating in the show and fell for each other. And But it's a very odd setup for a relationship. I don't um, think so. I, th- no, I don't think so. I like the way they did it, personally. Um, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and then the and final then... scene what the hell he walks away from the mirror out of the bathroom and there's still the reflection of him in the mirror whether that was literal or figurative I don't know yeah I want but... to do a whole episode on this a whole discussion piece Okay. Uh, but if you've got this far through guys well done thank you for watching <laughs> um, do, you think, do you think the producers know the mirror universe is not a literal mirror do they realize that? Yeah, I don't. I don't necessarily think they're saying that it's mirror universe, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, he's now a, a creature that can that has now got DNA of a creature that is indestructible ish, that can link to a network of you know. I mean, who's to say he can't link to the network at all times? You know. Mm. Um, yeah, this is a the hell of an ending. Kind of sinister, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it shows the actor, his very sort of like static face works really well for this sort of like, you know, I'm mm-hmm. I'm I'm not glaring, I'm not smiling, I'm looking, and you don't like my face, do you? So that, he has those sorts of looks, and so it worked perfectly for the mirror. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah. Weird. All right, well, that's it, guys. What do you guys think of the episode? Put it in the comments below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about mm-hmm. this ending? Is it an actual mm-hmm. representation of the mirror universe? Is it foreshadowing? What's going on here? So, um, yeah, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Close, closing thoughts and out of 10, Stuart? Oh, yes. Uh, out of 10, I would give this one probably an 8. I really enjoyed this episode. There was a lot about it that I liked. Um, closing thoughts, yeah. Uh, I thought it was well-paced. A lot of good action. Pacing was, yeah, pacing was pretty good, actually, on this one. We'll give Introduction to a few new characters, uh, as far as the um, lieutenant went and Harry Mudd. You know, things like that were awesome. I uh, get to see a development from Michael Burnham's character, which mm-hmm. I really liked. Kind of handing out that olive branch to uh, Saru. Um, overall, I just thought it was a great episode, and I really enjoyed this one. So yeah, I'll give it an eight. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a five point five, maybe a six, maybe. Uh, it just didn't come together for me. Like I said, I just walked away feeling a bit meh. Uh, you know, definitely Orville won this out of the two. And again, it seems to be strange how they keep swapping places. Um, in different ways for for me, yeah, it was fine. Had some cool little moments, but for some reason, it just didn't gel. Um, mm-hmm. And some some bad little choices throughout that bugged me. Um, and some really good choices that were fine because they weren't amazing. It's weird, mm-hmm. weird episode, weird episode. I wasn't really sold on it. Um, but again, no. I'm intrigued about more stuff. Um, great, I will say, great new character introduction for the the this, the, the guy in the cell. That was actually very well handled. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. There you go. And if you want to help out the show by, you know, donating, that would be nice. That'd be awesome. Help us out. We do all these reviews for you guys. Um, and thank you for watching them because, I mean, we enjoy doing them. Well, they're, yeah, they're not just reviews. They're full breakdown analysis, yeah. theorization. You know, we take themes and, and bits and moments and looks and technology. I mean, it's a full, you, know, you, you get to watch the episode again through us with stills, breaking down moments that you might have missed, you probably did miss. You know, uh, get to enjoy everything again and really go through it with Trek fans. Yeah, we have, we have right. fun doing this. Yeah, so if you want to help us out, you can do that by clicking the Patreon link in the description below or heading over to trekyards.com and hitting the donate button and just sharing it around in general would be awesome. Right. Yeah, like just as you said, just share it around. Anyway, you think Trek fans will enjoy. Uh, you guys would love these reviews. Um, hopefully we have some new perspectives that you hadn't thought before because we try and think about all the all the goods, bads, and the in-betweens. That's right. So hit the like button, yes. do the things, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything, and Please we will do. see you. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Until then, I'm Captain Foley. And I am Commander Kongs. Bye, guys.
Pegas. 